Hello, I'm uh, David Cohen from the Cardiovascular Research Foundation and St. Francis Hospital here in New York. And I'm uh, uh, privileged to be one of the chair people for uh, this session on antithrombotic therapy. My co-moderator is uh, Dr. Kimura from Japan, um, who will be uh, uh, introducing the first uh, several speakers. Uh, we have a great session. We have uh, six, uh, six lectures divided into two, uh, two sessions, um, both focusing on different areas of the challenging uh, uh, topic of uh, antiplatelet therapy uh, in contemporary practice. So Dr. Kimura, if you will, please. Thank you, David. Um, uh, we have uh, a really outside outstanding speakers in this session. And also uh, we have uh, four panelists, uh, Junya Ako and the uh, Alok Finn and uh, Kyungwoo Park and Suni Rao. So uh, let me introduce the uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Yi from uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, he will talk on the uh, shorter DAPT versus longer DAPT, uh, who, uh, whom and how. Uh, okay, Dr. Ye, please. Great, thank you, Dr. Kumar, and thank you, uh, Dr. Cohen, uh, for your invitation uh, as well, and the organizers. I'm going to speak about short and uh, DAPT versus long DAPT duration, whom and how. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures and funding. Uh, as we think about uh, the current uh, approaches to individualizing DAPT duration, it's important to remember that actually individualization of DAPT duration is one of the uh, guidelines uh, recommended in both. Uh, American, European, uh, and international guidelines. Uh, and, you know, and you can see this in, there's class 1A recommendation for the updated disease of the US guidelines. Uh, short DAP duration could be considered, uh, class 2B recommendations for short DAP duration that could be considered in patients at high bleeding risk, and a cl class 2B recommendation that you could go longer than six months in patients at high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk. And similarly, among ACS patients and European guidelines, again, a 2B recommendation that you could go either shorter or longer than the 12 month recommendation in ACS patients, depending on a patient's relative contributions of bleeding and ischemic risk. The how for how to do this is I think much more complicated, but at least at the start, there is a recommendation for us as individual clinicians to try to do this. So the question is how do we identify patients for short versus long death strategies? And I think it's, one can think about this in a couple of different ways. You can look at clinical factors, anatomical factors, and some procedural factors, which I think we should think about more, uh, those of us who are interventional cardiologists. Uh, clinical factors, I think the, uh, the sort of greatest consensus document we have is this effort that was led uh, by Dr. Uh, Philippe Urban uh, to create the high bleeding risk uh, ARC definitions. Uh, and so this was developed in 2018. Uh, they developed standardized definitions uh, for high bleeding risk based on these factors that you see on the right. Uh, and a patient who uh, underwent PCI who had approximately one year uh, greater than 4% risk of major bleeding, uh, BARC 3 to 5 bleeding, or greater than 1% risk of intracranial bleeding based on the accumulation of these factors was considered an HBR patient. And there are major and minor criteria. And if those of you who are not familiar with this, I highly recommend uh, reading this uh, document published jointly actually in the European Heart Journal and in circulation. Uh, there are other uh, validated bleeding scores that, that predated uh, the ARC, HBR, AFC definitions, including uh, Dr. Moran's Paris bleeding uh, risk score, which was developed in an all comers registry, uh, validated in the ADAPTS DES with moderate discrimination. And the factors here include clinical factors that I think we're aware of, older age, extremes of BMI, uh, smoking, anemia, and the use of triple therapy. Uh, the precise DAP score developed by Francesco Casca and Marcia Valjamigli uh, another bleeding score developed in a pooled cohort of randomized clinical trials validated in the PLATO trial and the BURN PCI registry. And those factors include a lower starting hemoglobin, higher white blood count, again, older age, common feature in bleeding risk scores, lower creatinine clearance, as well as prior bleeding. So these are all tools that one can use to quantify bleeding risk. And we know that bleeding risk matters. Um, and we know that bleeding risk matters in particular uh, for those at, at high bleeding risk. So here uh, we see a, a recent paper led by uh, Dr. Valjamigli and, and Francesco Costa, sh Costa showing that among patients with high precise DAP scores, that is patients with high bleeding risk, you saw that in this pooled cohort of randomized trials, that shorter DAP duration uh, led to significantly lower bleeding. And actually here, 
uh, seemingly lower ischemic, at least a trend toward lower ischemic risk, certainly low, uh, fewer net adverse cardiovascular events compared to longer DAP duration. And this is among all patients with high precise DAP scores, regardless of their baseline anatomical uh, complexity of their lesions. You can see that highlighted here uh, in all three situations, uh, worse outcomes, at least a trend toward worse outcomes uh, among patients who received shorter, uh, longer DAP duration led to worse outcomes among patients with high bleeding risk. On the flip side of it, it's important not to lose sight of there being a large number of patients who have low bleeding risk. So actually in this pooled cohort, 75% of patients had precise DAP scores less than 25. So mostly low, lower bleeding risk population in these studies. And among the low bleeding risk cohort, uh, there was actually no significant difference in bleeding among for shorter versus long DAP duration, but there was a significant difference in ischemic risk and ischemic events. So long DAP duration was better in these lower uh, precise DAP score patients. And actually it looked as if the uh, absolute risk reduction was greater among the complex PCI patients. So a flip side of focusing on bleeding risk is that uh, it's important not to lose sight of ischemic risk. And ACS patients, uh, acute coronary syndrome patients, particularly those with a high DAP score may benefit most from long duration of DAP. And as a reminder, this is the DAP score. On the left, it can be calculated. We showed in the DAP study that a higher DAP score was associated with a greater reduction in stent thrombosis, myocardial infarction, and actually lower impact of bleeding for longer duration versus shorter duration DAPT. And as a reminder, it is possible, I think consistent with that evidence, it is possible to, to go too short a duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, particularly among ACS patients. Here's data from the SMART DATE trial, which randomized patients to six versus 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy among 2,700 patients with ACS. And here, actually, the trial showed that there was a significant increase rate of myocardial infarction in the six-month DAPT group. So let's talk a little bit more about those anatomical factors related to coronary complexity. Here in a study by Gennaro Giustino, a pooled cohort of six RCTs comparing short duration versus long duration. Here, short duration was three to six months of DAPT versus long duration was 12 months of DAPT or more. That complex lesions, so when you had more than three complex, greater than or equal to three complex features, you had a greater reduction favoring the longer DAP duration. And as you have fewer uh, complex features, you basically had no difference uh, in the adjusted hazard ratio for major adverse cardiovascular events. So at least in this comparison, it looked like the coronary anatomical complexity matter. Now you have to couple that with the other paper I showed you before, which was this is really concentrated among those patients at lower bleeding risk. Now we did a similar analysis in the DAPT study and we showed actually a different finding, which was that in those patients, when you were comparing 12 months versus 30 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, it didn't seem to matter whether or not you had zero, one or greater than or equal to two complex coronary characteristics. You seem to benefit from long duration DAPT with reductions in ischemic events. And it was, and it led also to an associated increase in bleeding. So my takeaway, I don't think these two studies are disparate actually. And my takeaway is that coronary complexity seems to influence DAP duration most within the first year of PCI, especially among the lower bleeding patients, bleeding risk patients. And thereafter, after a year, you've made it past a year or longer, it's, much, it's likely it matters much less, and it seems to be superseded by other clinical risk factors. So the how, uh, should we give short, shorter versus longer duration DAPs? Again, I, I don't have time to answer all of the questions related to this, uh, and there's an incredible amount of evidence out there. But I think short duration DAPs in general uh, should be given to those patients who, for whom the bleeding risk exceeds the ischemic risk, giving you some tools, and there are other tools available to help you discern that. But there are remaining questions. Do we give DAPT for one month? Is that short duration DAPT? Is it three months? Do we discontinue the P2Y12 inhibitor at the end or discontinue aspirin? I think that is the, the kind of the newest and most important question uh, based on some, some, some data that, uh, that I think, I hope Dr. Moran will talk about. Uh, which two, which two P2Y12 inhibitors should we use when we use short duration DAPT? And then for longer duration DAPT, that should be reserved for the patients for whom the ischemic risk exceeds the bleeding. I'll just remind you again that I think we've lost sight of these patients, but they are out there and they are not a small proportion of the patients we see. But again, there are remaining questions. Do we give DAPT for 12 months, 24, 30? In some cases, do we think about giving it indefinitely? Do we discontinue the P2Y12 inhibitor at the end or discontinue aspirin? 
Should we give a lower dose of PTY12 inhibitor, for example, as was, done, as was done in the Pegasus trial? And then if we give a PTY12 inhibitor, continue onwards, which one should we use? And I just want to highlight just briefly that this new sort of single antiplatelet therapy with a PTY12 inhibitor is, I think, the, the, the latest regimen that many people are considering in their clinical practice. And we've had a growing number of clinical trials that have been evaluated this, uh, most notably, I think, the TWILIGHT trial. Uh, Michelle O'Donohue that led a meta-analysis uh, of the trials, and really these results were driven by uh, Roxana's TWILIGHT trial, which showed that in those patients who discontinued DAPT and then went to single antiplatelet therapy uh, early versus continuing dual antiplatelet therapy, that, that there was a reduction in bleeding. So dropping the aspirin led to reduction in bleeding, and it did not appear to be associated with an increase in thrombotic events. So it may well be that this is a sweet spot for continuing dual antiplatelet or single antiplatelet therapy uh, without having an excess of ischemic risk uh, when, this, when one agent is discontinued. So in conclusion, I think the cliche holds, holds true. There is no one size fits all for DAPT strategies. Shortening duration and stable CAD likely does not meaningfully increase ischemic risk, uh, but it doesn't seem to necessarily decrease bleeding events in lowest populations either. So use tools to identify the HBR patients, and we have the HBR uh, ARC as well as the other risk scores, and those patients may benefit from shorter DAP duration, but remember that many patients are not HBR and they will still benefit from longer durations of DAP, particularly ACS patients or those with high DAP score. And finally, within these broad recommendations, there are still many different approaches clinicians might take. Thanks very much. Uh, oh, thank you, Robert. Uh, it's a great talk. Uh, uh, we have discussion later, uh, so let's move on to the next speak, next talk. And the uh, next speaker is uh, Lokisana uh, Meran uh, from uh, Mount Sinai, New York. Uh, uh, she will talk on the uh, Zion short DAPT clinical program. Lokisana, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ye. That was a fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. And uh, now we dig into some of the um, uh, short duration of DAPT programs. And the one that I'm going to talk about is the Zions uh, short DAPT program. Um, I think the concept of talking about the, the duration of DAPT is one that is incredibly important. I'm going to leave my disclosures on online. Um, I uh, will be talking about the, the Zions program, which is um, funded by Abbott Vascular uh, but, uh, and I will not be talking about the Twilight uh, trial here. Um, so we already heard uh, how, how essential du uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is in preventing ischemic events, but we also know that it increases bleeding and the patients who are at high bleeding risk are not uh, just a few uh, and far in between. I believe that we can see them as high as 40%, especially if we use the ARC HBR criteria that Dr. Ye just presented. And we also are extremely concerned that um, hemorrhagic events do have very important prognostic implications. And we're now looking for these bleeding avoidance strategies, which I believe are vital in order to improve and enhance and get the best possible benefit for our patients. So the current generation drug eluting stents have, um, have been tested now with a shorter duration of DAPT, um, but the optimal duration is really not known. So today I wanna to talk to you about the stents that we use a lot uh, and we have probably the most amount of clinical data on the Zion stent. This is a multi-link cobalt chromium uh, alloy with a strut thickness that's quite thin at 81 microns with a durable fluoropolymer coating, which has important fluoropassivation properties, uh, which has been proven by uh, Dr. Vermani and Dr. Finn to show that um, there is selective retaining of albumin and minimization of platelet adhesion. And we don't talk a lot about this durable polymer, but the preclinical work has been tremendous that was done um, at CVPATH, and the drug is Everolimus. So the hypothesis here was that in high bleeding risk, risk patients who have a Zion stent, who complete a short duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, two separate programs, the Zions 28 for one month, Zions 90 for three months, can we evaluate 
that if those who have not had any adverse events in during those uh, one or three months, that treating with aspirin monotherapy would be non-inferior to continuing dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. And we wanted to look at a very important ischemic events, death and myocardial infarction. And of course, we wanted to see some superiority to bleeding. So the objective was uh, to evaluate, as I said, death and MI for those patients between one and three months and 12 months, and to determine that impact on BARC two to five bleeding. But we also looked at significant BARC three to five, and then very important evaluation of stent thrombosis, definite and probable, all of this against uh, a um, previously well done studies of Zions v. USA, and I'll talk to you about that. So here's the program, pretty large program, comprehensive program that basically encompassed a global um, uh, enrollment of about 3,600 patients between one and three months of DAP. There was no randomization uh, between three to one months. I want to make sure it's understood. Both of these studies were single arm studies, uh, and we compared it to Zions v. USA. We included high bleeding risk patients. The criteria are here that was used for this particular program. HBR criteria had not yet been, um, ARC HBR had not been published, but you can see a lot of those categories were undertaken, age, uh, age oral anticoagulant, CKD anemia, um, low platelet count, major bleeding in the last 12 months, and even a history of stroke. <clears throat> and you had to have a successful PCI with the exclusive use of, use of a Zion stent in vessel sizes of 225 to 4.25 with a lesion like no longer than 32 millimeters and no, no more than three target lesions. We importantly excluded STEMI, low ejection fraction, and planned surgery. And we did exclude overlapping stents, um, thrombus containing lesions, left main, saphenous vein graft, ISR, and CTL. So uh, you can see what kinds of patients were enrolled. Here's the trial design between the two, two single arm studies. Index PCI performed a duration of three for Zions 90, tw uh, one month uh, for uh, Zions 28 of dual antiplatelet therapy, and then an observation period for, um, for both of these um, uh, these patients all the way to 12 months for Zions 90. And I'm going to present to you the primary endpoint for Zions 28 was at six months. Here's how you could see how they're different. Um, death and MI was uh, powered endpoints versus controlled for Zions 90 and 28. And um, uh, the key secondary endpoints were BARC 2 to 5 bleeding, uh, again, for both of these trials. And definite probable stent thrombosis was powered only for Zions 90 against the performance goal. We used a propensity scored stratification such that we would not lose any patients in the Zions 90 or Zions 28. So these patients were stratified into uh, five different quintiles. And you can see here between amongst these patients compared to similar patients in Zions v. USA, which was an all comer, all inclusive types of patients, the rates of death and myocardial infarction mean across the five quintiles were similar and the non-inferiority primary endpoint was met. And you can see that here. And the same goes for Zions 28, uh, where it was 3.5% versus 4.3% with similar patients across the five quintiles. This is a mean uh, rate across the quintiles. And uh, here again, the non-inferiority um, uh, was met and so was the primary endpoint for that hard endpoint of death and myocardial infarction. BARC 2.5 bleeding, interestingly enough, was not met. And perhaps this was because in Zions v. USA, there was no mandate in collecting BARC 2 bleeds. But certainly when you look at the significant BARC 3 to 5 bleeds, which are really the ones we care about, there was a significant reduction uh, in Zions 90 and also in Zions 28 with the shorter duration of DAPT compared to Zions v. USA where 12 months was chosen in these patients. Stent thrombosis was quite rare against the performance goal. We met that uh, 
very, very well, only four patients uh, in Zions 90 during that observation period out to one year from three to 12 months experience uh, a stent thrombosis. And you can see that in Zions 28, it was also quite rare, only four patients. Uh, so really, really good results. So among uh, what we could conclude with this 3,600 patients that um, the um, in this HBR patient subgroup, that a short duration of one or three months really did well compared to what standard 12 months DAPT was in a, a previous study. We showed non-inferior ischemic outcomes, similar rates of clinical relevant bleeding, but a significant reduction in BARC three to five bleeds and an extremely low rates of stent thrombosis during that period on single uh, aspirin monotherapy. Thank you so much for your attention. And there's the Zions Short DAPT program. Uh, thank you very much, Roxana. Uh, great results from the Zions Short DAPT program. Uh, thank you very much. So let's move on to the uh, final talk in this uh, first session. Uh, I am very pleased to introduce Dominico Angelino from uh, Florida. Uh, he will talk on the uh, anti-thrombotic strategies of diabetic patients. Uh, Dominique, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Kimura, and pleasure to be here. So over the next 10 minutes, I will be speaking about uh, new antithrombotic strategies in patients with uh, diabetes. Uh, here you see my disclosures. So uh, we, we know from a, a number of studies that uh, patients with diabetes are at increased risk of uh, thrombotic complications, uh, greater short and long-term uh, uh, mortality. Uh, this is irrespective of their clinical presentation. And the other thing that we know, especially for us cardiologists, uh, we do have job security because you can see here that uh, the uh, prevalence of uh, diabetes will be doubling over the next uh, two uh, uh, decades. Now, uh, one of the key mechanisms leading to uh, the uh, uh, increased risk of thrombotic complications in uh, this patient cohort is what you see on this cartoon, that there are multiple, multiple mechanisms associated with uh, enhanced uh, platelet uh, reactivity. Uh, we don't have time to go through this cartoon, but one of the things that we do know is that over the course of the past two decades, uh, uh, with the introduction of new antithrombotic strategy, analyzing this diabetic cohort has been of a key interest. And the thing that we have learned through these trials is what you see here. Don't bring a knife uh, to a gunfight. So what does this actually mean? It means that uh, we do have antithrombotic strategies that may be more or less effective in uh, this uh, setting. So clearly, uh, clopidogrel has shown not to be a, a gun in these studies. We have uh, a large number of pharmacodynamic studies, as you can see here, irrespective of whether it's an acute phase or long-term phase, uh, that uh, clopidogrel is not that effective in patients with diabetes. And the key mechanism is related to the fact that uh, these patients have very inadequate uh, generation of the uh, active metabolite. There's a 40% lower generation of the active metabolite which uh, clearly uh, sets the stage for the uh, newer P2I12 inhibitors, uh, including Prasigrel and Ticagrelor, as you can see here in the triton timmy 38 and PLATO trials, uh, which were in favor of uh, these newer agents over clopidogrel, consistent findings uh, in the diabetic cohort. Now, when we look at this uh, data uh, indirectly, originally one would say, well, uh, Prasigrel is particularly efficacious in, in patients with diabetes compared with Ticagrelor, but again, it's not the correct way of interpreting the data uh, because, again, uh, there was no interaction and the data were consistent. Now, one of the key questions that emerged uh, afterwards was, is one of, one of the two agents better uh, in the diabetic cohort? And here you see insights from the ISO-REACT-5 trial which was recently published in JAK Intervention. As a reminder, uh, the uh, ISORAC-5 trial was a trial uh, that uh, ultimately showed Prasigrel to be superior to Ticagrelor. Uh, but one of the things that emerged uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, di diabetic analysis was that there was actually an, an interaction. As you can see here, uh, the, uh, there were no differences between the two agents uh, in patients with diabetes and actually uh, patients uh, treated with 
uh, uh, Ticago had a lower uh, event rate compared with uh, Prasugrel. So the question became, why were these findings observed in patients with diabetes in the trial? Now, one of the explanations could be related to the uh, differences in the way these two drugs work in a patient with diabetes. And here you see insights from uh, one of our pharmacodynamic studies, the Optimus 4 study, which was originally designed to show a superiority of Prasugrel over Ticagrel based on some of the original findings. And here, clearly, you can see that Ticagrel was a more effective drug compared to Prasugrel in patients with, uh, uh, with diabetes. And this may be related to the fact that uh, patients with diabetes have higher platelet turnover rates and therefore giving a twice daily drug may be more efficacious. The next question uh, is what do we do with these patients long-term? We spoke about one year after ACS, what do we do uh, uh, lifelong? Do we continue with ADAPT strategy or with a DPI? Definitely from a DAP perspective, one of the best evidence that we have comes from the uh, uh, Pegasus uh, uh, trial, where you can uh, uh, see that the, there was a benefit of uh, adding Ticagrelor to aspirin uh, compared to uh, aspirin uh, alone, irrespective of diabetic status. Similar relative risk reduction, but given the higher event rates in patients with diabetes, uh, there was a greater absolute risk reduction and also uh, a reduction in uh, mortality with this uh, strategy of long-term ticagrelor therapy. Another important uh, analysis looking at uh, secondary prevention or combination of primary secondary prevention was coming from the Themis trial, which a difference from the uh, 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 the uh, Pegasus study, which was in patients with a prior MI, these were patients who did not have a prior acute cardiovascular event. So no prior MI or no prior strokes, so patients who were traditionally treated in aspirin. And there was a, a, a borderline marginal statistically significant reduction with a, a Ticagrelor uh, compared to a placebo. This was offset by a significant increase in bleeding. So it was almost a wash. Nevertheless, when looking at uh, patients who had a history of PCI versus those who did not have a prior history of PCI, you can see that the magnitude of benefit was uh, significantly higher in those patients who had a history of PCI. Now, uh, during the conduct of the, of the Themis PCI study, the question emerged, well, what do we do with those patients uh, who uh, may be on, uh, on, uh, on Ticagrelor 60 milligram because that was the dose in the study and who may require a coronary intervention uh, where we know that Ticagrelor 60 milligram had never been studied in PCI. And here you can see from a pharmacodynamic study uh, done in parallel, which was the Optimus 6, clearly shows, again, clopidogrel is not a good drug in these patients while well, using even a 60 milligram dose of Ticagrelor is associated with a significantly reduced platelet reactivity and gives a lot of comfort of using this dosing regimen if you have to send the patient to the cat lab. Now, we do know that patients with diabetes are not only at increased risk for recurrent uh, uh, thrombotic events, but are also increased risk for, for bleeding. We heard about before uh, the, uh, uh, the, the topic of aspirin-free strategies after PCI. Uh, this is something that uh, Dr. Cabodano will speak, be speaking about a little bit uh, 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 later. Uh, we know that we have over 30,000 patients from uh, uh, trials of dropping aspirin, supporting the safety uh, of uh, the strategy. And as Bobby already alluded to before, uh, the uh, best data that we have out there derives from the TWILIGHT uh, uh, trial. Here you see the diabetic analysis uh, from the study in over 2,600 patients, uh, supporting a significant reduction in BARC 2 to 5 bleeding, but importantly, BARC 3 or 5 bleeding, so the big, big bleeds with an aspirin-free strategy on the background of Ticagrelor therapy. And importantly, there was no signal whatsoever of an increase in thrombotic complications, even in this very high-risk uh, uh, cohort. Now, while there are strategies shying away from aspirin, there are other strategies looking at what can we do on top uh, of aspirin, and particularly looking at a low dose of an oral anticoagulant. This is a strategy that we call as a dual pathway inhibition because we target two pathways. And you can see here the data from the COMPASS trial looking at this strategy. And here you see the diabetic analysis where the uh, patients with diabetes, again, higher risk. Uh, uh, there was a, a greater absolute risk reduction, although there was a parallel relative risk reduction in the diabetic cohort. 
I'm going to finalize with a, 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 with a, a concept which is based on the fact that regardless of the strategies, we know that aspirin still remains the mainstay of treatment for long-term secondary prevention in most of our patients with diabetes. And so the question becomes, can we be smarter about with the way we use the aspirin? And the answer is perhaps yes. What we do know, as alluded to before, patients with diabetes have higher platelet turnover rates. Therefore, there has been the suggestion of administering aspirin twice daily. This is associated with more effective platelet inhibition. Ongoing studies to, be, to see if this is associated with better clinical outcomes. But we can also look into new formulations of aspirin, aspirin formulations that uh, are absorbed better, uh, such as this compound called Vazilor, which has been studied in patients with diabetes. And you can see here compared, particularly with enteric coated aspirin, greater uh, absorption uh, of the drug. Last but not least, we can speak about antithrombotic strategies as much as we want, but we must keep in mind the ABCs of treatment of diabetic patients, good glucose control, blood pressure, and cholesterol, because these are all associated with reduced platelet reactivity. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Uh, excellent talk uh, for excellent uh, dedicated talk for diabetes. Uh, thank you very much. We have uh, ten minutes uh, for discussion. So first, I would like to ask the uh, uh, panelists uh, about the uh, your uh, current uh, strategy for HBL patients and also uh, uh, who have complex uh, uh, PCI uh, uh, patients with complex PCI. Uh, so uh, particularly. DAPT duration. Uh, so how about uh, uh, Dr. Ako? Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent talks. Uh, so in Japan, uh, as you know, the Dr. Kimura led uh, several important clinical studies called the Stop DAP Studies uh, Series. And we are very, uh, very much accustomed to, uh, you know, put patient on one month DAP. And the, uh, we have shown that uh, the one month DAP is uh, safe in most patients uh, when we use a Zion stent, uh, which is the most uh, least uh, uh, thrombotic uh, uh, stent in the world. So, uh, I, in the uh, recently, Dr. Kimura also showed that in very complex uh, lesion, in very complex lesions, uh, one month depth uh, strategy is also safe and effective. Uh, so. Uh, in Japan, many uh, physicians, many interventional cardiologists are, uh, you know, adopting uh, very, very short or ultra short uh, DAPT uh, here in Japan. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, how about Dr. Finn? Um, I would say that the great series of lectures, first of all, I really enjoyed them. I also am a believer that short-term DAPT is really an important strategy in high bleeding risk patients. So I would say that you've shown as well in your stop dap 2 trial sub-analysis, as well as in Roxana's data she just showed today that you know people with high bleeding risk do fairly well with short-term DAP. So I'd say a regimen of you know either one or three months with certain types of stents is that have been proven to be effective in this setting, either Zyance or Resolute is the way to go. If they're not short, if, it, not, if they're not HBR, I, I agree with what Bobby said in terms of you know, you can protect, uh, pre prevent non-culprit lesions uh, from thrombosing if you use longer term DAP. So I think it really depends on HBR or non HBR. Okay, thank you very much. How about Dr. Park? Yeah, so um, I think it depends on whether the patient has um, is presented as an ACS or is a stable patient. Um, if it's a stable patient with HBR, I think um, the consensus in Korea is to use a short duration of DAP. Uh, for my practice, I usually give uh, three months of DAP, but um, um, most of our patients are usually enrolled in clinical trials, so we can't really say uh, I give all my patients uh, three months DAP. So, uh, but um, for patients with uh, ACS, it's a um, slightly different story. Um, uh, you have to be very selective about uh, which route you uh, you take, uh, and I think uh, in Korea. Um, we worry a lot about bleeding in our patients because we feel that our East, East Asian patients have a slightly higher preponderance for bleeding uh, relative to the risk of ischemia. So um, it's a challenge for us to try to identify the patients who will benefit from the longer duration uh, of, of DAPT. Uh, and also, 
Um, I completely agree with the um, with what was said before by Dr. Ye about um, the the com complexity of the PCI being more important within the first one to maybe six months post PCI. But then uh, after that, you know, six months on, twelve months on, it's the clinical complexity that really determines um, the antiplatelet therapy. So. Um, you really have to make a good balance between the clinical complexity of the patients, how many clinical risk factors the patient has versus um, the high bleeding risk features. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how about Dr. Rao? Yeah, I, I think I could uh, probably say the same. Um, you know, I think that uh, for us, we tend to use one month of, of uh, du dual antiplatelet therapy in high bleeding risk patients. I think the big question for us after that one month period is whether we should continue aspirin or P2Y12. I mean, clearly there's a preponderance of GI bleeding uh, beyond that point. And we know that aspirin is directly toxic to the, uh, the GI mucosa. Uh, you know, people have probably forgotten the old Capri trial, which was uh, the trial of clopidogrel versus aspirin. Now it's not directly relevant to what we're talking about here, but it is, um, you know, it, it does involve the comparison between a P2Y12 inhibitor and aspirin. And it was barely statistically significantly better with lower bleeding. So, you know, I think that's a very compelling strategy. I think, you know, with Roxana's trial, it, it adds more data to support a strategy of, of single antiplatelet therapy with P2Y12. It'd be great to see more data on that strategy, particularly as it relates to long-term bleeding risk. And I think it's good that we now have the major, the three major stent platforms that are in use in the United States have data now with short DAPT. So that gives us some measure of, of comfort with respect to the safety of that. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to ask Roxana, uh, actually the short DAPT uh, science program uh, 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 adopts the uh, aspirin monotherapy after uh, stopping DAPT one month or three months. Uh, so it's uh, quite a unique uh, strategy uh, compared with the uh, uh, PTY-12 monotherapy. So could you comment on that? Yeah, so... Um... Sansa Kamura, thank you so much uh, for that excellent uh, question. And at the time when the, the trial was done, and as you know, this was sort of an FDA study, um, there was, um, a, you know, the monotherapy was about aspirin. You know, we forget that this P2Y12 monotherapy is a new novel concept that you all in Japan were extremely brave to actually perform with clopidogrel monotherapy knowing that there is some non-responsiveness even with clopidogrel and you were extremely successful with the Zions platform, but also everyone should note that in Japan, uh, there is really excellent intravascular imaging that goes on in conjunction with your stent procedures, especially if there's complex lesion morphology. And I think that the audience should take away that if you're going to go to a shorter duration and you're going to stop the aspirin and go to P2Y12 monotherapy, especially with clopidogrel, that there should be some level of um, confidence that you've done a great job, like using intravascular imaging or understanding that the patient is responsive to clopidogrel. Uh, I'd be very nervous, for example, if I did a left main bifurcation and um, in a month, you know, HBR patient without intravascular imaging. And in a month, I would stop the, um, you know, aspirin and go to P2Y12 monotherapy with clopidogrel. I would be less nervous if it was ticagrelor or even prasagrel, uh, even though we don't have a lot of data. I just would caution everyone to think about that. Your data is tremendous out of um, a stop DAP2 trial but I also know how well you perform procedures in Japan. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, I, I think the uh, uh, Zions 28, Zions 90 uh, seems to uh, be very good results, uh, very comparable yes. to that uh, 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 P2Y12 uh, receptor broker monotherapy. So, so do you think it's a, a, is there a big difference between uh, aspirin and the P2Y12 uh, monotherapy? Um, look, I personally, I think that P2Y12 monotherapy would be a better approach in most mm -hmm. patients. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I, I also, as I said, you know, what we had in Zions 90, Zions, uh, Zions 28, 
was we excluded a lot of high risk patients. You saw mm -hmm. that. I mm -hmm. made sure that the, the exclusion criteria of trials are more important than inclusion criteria. <laughs> I hope people will take that away because I think you have to know what this isn't for. We don't have STEMI. We didn't have bifurcation lesions. You know, the real true high risk uh, PCI that uh, Dr. Ye spoke about was excluded. But this, regardless, it, it was a very, very successful stent platform, given what we know from the preclinical work that Dr. Finn has performed, as well as Dr. Bermani, that this is a, a very safe platform. Uh, and it, there is some, flor the floral passivation does give you some platelet, um, you know, uh, non-adhesiveness, if you will. So I think it's a very, very um, good way forward. Um, I love the idea of moving to a novel uh, P2I12 monotherapy. And as much as I love it, I don't want people to then just stop and leave people with on, on nothing who are, who have so much um, disease. And so, you know, I get nervous that people won't use that for a lifetime due to costs, and then they won't get the, um, the reduction with aspirin monotherapy down the line for long-term use. So I think we have to be very, um, uh, very uh, open and transparent about what are clinicians doing? We are in a different uh, place. We perform trials and we're hoping to educate people, but most people need a lot of direction to make sure that the patients is on, are on something for secondary prevention. Uh, and aspirin is a cheap drug and hopefully these newer, um, newer uh, formulations could be of help but personally, I hope we can use a, a novel um, P2I12 monotherapy going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any comment from other participants? All right, it's a, a, this is a, a great discussion. I wanted to switch it around just a little bit for our last question before we move on to the, uh, to the next uh, series of lectures and talk about the group that we haven't been specifically discussing here, which is the group that requires oral anticoagulation. Um, patients who have atrial fibrillation and mechanical valve. Um, and that, that's the group that really started the whole trend of uh, uh, single antiplatelet therapy. But the, 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 the question I want to go to though, is one we haven't talked about in the, in the, in the lectures, which is what do you do um, you know, at the end of a year uh, in that group of patients? So you have a patient who is uh, taking, who has atrial fibrillation, let's just say, uh, who is taking either a, a, a vitamin K antagonist or is taking a DOAC, uh, you know, the, the, the Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, something like that. Uh, they've had their PCI. Uh, they've completed uh, a year of therapy. Um, should we be stopping all antiplatelet therapy in that group of patients? Should we be continuing a low dose of something? Uh, so I see KW, uh, you are nodding away there. What, what are your thoughts about, uh, about that uh, challenging? I mean, we, we ask this question all the time in our, um, you know, in our local, um, you know, uh, Congress. And if we have a session where the half of the panelists are EP physicians and the other half are, P are PCI interventionists, and you ask the EP physicians, what are you gonna do after one year? They say, absolutely, you just use a NOAC and just forget about it, right? <laughs> uh, and, then, and then you see the other half of the side going, mm, I don't think so. You know, I, I feel uncomfortable when I don't have my patient on any antiplatelet agent. So I think it's an area that has no evidence as of, as of now, because the only evidence that we have is the FIRE trial, which showed um, the single uh, mono on NOAC is, is superior, but most of these patients were not those that received PCI, but actually were on just sort of um, chronic therapy. Um, so uh, actually, you know, if you finish the six months of, of required therapy or one, one year of required therapy, and then you are at a situation where you decide that monotherapy versus something else, uh, where should you go? Uh, and actually we're doing a, a study currently where um, we're randomizing between um, using a full dose of apixaban um, after one year, uh, mono, versus uh, using a uh, uh, P2I12 inhibitor plus a lower dose of, um, so clopidogrel plus a lower dose of NOAC, uh, which the EP physicians hate because they always say if you, if you underdose the patients with a NOAC, uh, you're not going to uh, protect them from uh, a stroke event. But a lot of our, you know, intervention uh, colleagues feel sort of that's the sweet spot where you lower the dose of the uh, uh, of the DOAC and, and maybe 
continue the patient on a clopidogrel or a P512 inhibitor. So I'll get to the more complicated. Do, right. Dr. Do, Dr. Akko, I, I, um, what, what are you doing in Japan right now for that group? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, as an, uh, as an, one of the uh, co-investigators of uh, a fire trial, uh, I'm convinced that uh, you know, uh, DOAC monotherapy is the way to go. And the, uh, we are doing a lot of uh, sub analysis from a fire trial, but those sub analysis, even in the highest uh, thrombotic risk patients, they benefit from, uh, you know, uh, DOAC alone. So uh, I think, I believe that the, uh, maybe in the future, uh, a lot of uh, physicians are taking up uh, DOAC monotherapy as compared with uh, combination therapy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the interest of time. Uh, let's move on to the second part of the session. Uh, David, please. Well, thank you. That was a great discussion. I, I, I still have more questions, but we have to keep moving, unfortunately, <laughs> the, uh, uh, for it. So our next, uh, next session uh, really continues the theme, but looking at some very specific uh, groups of patients. Uh, and the first lecture will be by uh, uh, Philippe Urban uh, from Switzerland. Um, who will be speaking on tailored anti-thrombotic uh, strategies for CHIP and high bleeding risk patients, um, how to do. So maybe we will learn from the Swiss uh, um, how we should answer all these complicated questions. Uh, Dr. Urban. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's been extremely interesting so far. I hope it stays that way. I'm going to try and go through the title that was given to me, tailoring anti-thrombotic strategies for two specific groups, the CHIP and the HBR patients. These are my disclosures. We've seen this slide before. I had the privilege of working with a group of uh, physicians and experts in the field to define patients who were at high bleeding risk. And the definition is based on easily accessible clinical parameters, which are listed here, age, a number of comorbidities, some laboratory values, a history of CNS problems, a history of bleeding, and then some iatrogenic situations that we've just touched on, need for oral anticoagulants being one of the major ones. It was interesting to me, and thanks to different groups, uh, to find out that these patients were actually more frequent in everyday clinical practice than I had initially thought. There's a series from Japan, a series from Switzerland, and one from the East Coast of the US, and all three came up with the same idea, ballpark, that it's about 40% of uh, patients in everyday routine PCI who can be qualified as ARC HBR. So it's a large group. Another important point is that yes, the bleeding is increased. Looking at these three series here, you see that the risk of bleeding versus non ARC HBR is roughly three times higher. But if you look at the ischemic endpoints, usually MI or ST, you see that the risk of an ischemic endpoint in these high bleeding risk patients is something like double. So the stakes are high. Looking briefly at CHIPS, which is not uh, my particular area of interest, but it's basically a definition which is in large part based on the fact that the procedure is going to be difficult. Complex anatomy, difficult distal targets, but it also includes some parameters that have to do with comorbidity and the fact that a patient who requires revascularization is not a good surgical candidate. And then poor LV, um, concurrent valve disease, poor hemodynamics. And based on these three groups, you can make a long list, and this is not complete, of the sort of situations who could be considered as representative of a CHIP patient. In fact, there's quite a fair degree of overlap between the CHIP definition and the ESC definition of patients who are considered at high thrombotic risk, HTR, if you will. And we don't want to go into detail, but certainly a number of these would qualify as CHIP characteristics. And I would add uh, the intervention to a saphenous vein graft target, which actually I think should have been in that list for some reason, didn't get there. If we look at the two groups, HBR and CHIP, we see that uh, perhaps just to recap, the, the CHIP uh, patients are essentially defined based on the technical challenge they represent. But with that come an increased thrombotic risk, probably quite often an increased bleeding risk, and it's a very heterogeneous group. HBR patients are defined by their bleeding risk. The technical challenge doesn't necessarily have to be a major one at all, but it sometimes is, of course. 
Thrombotic risk is increased, somewhat less than bleeding, and the group is also heterogeneous. Importantly, both these groups have been excluded or underrepresented for randomized clinical trials, so the task of defining their optimal treatment is obviously a little complex. We tried to address this with, again, a group of people who were part of the ARC-HBR project, together with uh, the statistical help of Stuart Pocock, John Gregson, and Ruth Owen. And we put together a group of patients to try and tease out what the predictors were of uh, both major bleeding, BARC 3, 4, or 5, and the ischemic endpoint composed of myocardial infarction and or stent thrombosis. And this was published just recently in January in JAMA. We took six studies to look at this uh, trade-off model. So in excess of 12,000 patients, and you, the, the six trials are listed here. And as you can see, the proportion of patients who were ARC-HBR obviously was very variable. Some trials inc pointedly included uh, patients who were at increased bleeding risk. Others, such as Paris and Century 2, did not particularly look at, for those patients, and in fact, in some cases, excluded them. We then focused on those patients who were ARC-HBR somewhat more than half, 6,600 plus. And again, if you look at the risk of bark bleeding, it's four times higher for the ARC-HBR patients than for those who are not. And if you look at the MI and ST risk, it's over twice as high. So the same message again, both problems occur at a higher rate. Then we looked at the multivariate predictors. And when I say we, I mean Stuart, John, and Ruth. And I read all this with interest. But basically, you could look at predictors for bark bleeding or for MI and SD. We had four predictors for bleeding only. Those were the need for oral anticoagulants at discharge, the presence of either severe liver disease, cancer, or planned major surgery, age above a cutoff of 65, and the presence of obstructive chronic pulmonary disease. Then there were four predictors of MI and ST only. Those were a history of prior MI, a presentation with MI, presence of diabetes, and the use of a bare metal stent. And there were four predictors that worked for both type of adverse events, but to a differing degree. Anemia predicted both, but it mostly predicted BARC 3.5, if you look at the hazard ratios. Renal failure was also rather balanced, slightly more powerfully predicting MIST. Smoking predicted both in a very similar way, and a complex procedure predicted both somewhat more for MIST. The C stats were moderately satisfactory. We validated the model in a subset of ARC-HBR Onyx-1 patients, and the C stats remained very stable. In fact, they increased somewhat. Some of these uh, factors, that, which are in red here, actually also work, well, they're also chip uh, characteristics of this model. It's designed for ARC-HBR. It may be appropriate sometimes to use for chip patients. If we then plot the 6,600 plus patients, uh, the risk of bleeding and the risk of MINSD, we find this result with this scatter plot. The black line is the line of equal trade-off, the same risk of both events along that line. The red or orange line is a mortality weighted trade-off because these patients actually had nearly twice higher risk of dying after MISD than they did after uh, bleeding. Importantly, periprocedural events were excluded, so periprocedural MI is not part of this model. You can then uh, show that this, the patients will fall in one of these three groups, a higher thrombotic risk, 44%, a higher bleeding risk, 20 something percent, and then a gray zone where the risk of bleeding and thrombosis can be considered comparable. Just two patients to illustrate this, both of whom are ARC-HBR, 79 year old man, angina, oral anticoagulants, ex-smoker with significant lung damage, recent surgery for cancer, quite marked anemia, reasonable renal function. He gets a single drug eluting stent to the proximal LED. He's discharged on clopidogrel and oral anticoagulants. And you can see that his bleeding risk is very high in the range of 30%. His MIST risk is really low, below 2.5. So that might help you decide how much drug and how long you want to treat him for. 
another patient, also RHBR, a younger lady presents with non STEMI. She's had a previous heart attack. She's diabetic. She's still smoking. She's on um, ibuprofen. Her hemoglobin level is uh, reasonable. Her renal function is pretty poor. She has a complex procedure with four drug eluting stents. She's discharged on ticagrelor and aspirin. Her thrombotic risk is dramatically high, above 20%. Her bleeding risk is just about on 4%. So yes, both of those patients are RKHBR, but their individual situation is extremely different. Some of this data is already available on the RKHBR application. We're working on the trade-off to make it available on the same uh, application that should be available in April this year when this presentation becomes available. Uh, and I think that's maybe a useful tool uh, at the bedside or in the cath lab. So both, uh, ARC, both ARC HBR and CHIP patients have an increased risk of thrombosis and bleeding associated with PCI. Both groups are heterogeneous, makes it difficult, but they overlap to some degree. They both have been excluded or underrepresented in clinical trials. And we hope that the recently developed trade-off model for RKHBR patients, which will soon be available as a smartphone application, may help to better quantify bleeding and thrombotic risk and hopefully assist in defining revascularization strategies and optimizing individual antithrombotic regimens. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Philippe. That was a, a a wonderful uh, presentation, and I'm, I really look forward to uh, having access to that uh, uh, trade-off uh, calculator. I think that will be enormously uh, beneficial, just as the uh, the, the, DAPT cal the DAPT score calculator um, has been uh, up in, up until now. Um, so our next uh, uh, speaker uh, needs very little introduction. Uh, uh, Davide Capadano uh, uh, from uh, Italy uh, will be speaking, uh, uh, really giving us uh, more information about the. Uh, new strategy of short DAPT followed by P2Y12 monotherapy, uh, new trend, trend updates and clinical evidence. Uh, Davide. Thank you, David. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, yes, my task is to discuss a little bit more in detail what we know regarding the aspirin-free strategies that we have alluded to in the previous uh, discussion. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge that this is something uh, changing in the uh, perspective of uh, uh, randomized trials in antithrombotic therapy across the spectrum of coronary artery disease. Because if you look at the uh, trials in green, essentially these were trials intended to replace aspirin with other agents. And basically all of them with few exceptions failed. If you look at the uh, blue trials, essentially this is the history of uh, antithrombotic therapy trials with new strategies uh, and new drugs added on top of aspirin. This has been the routine uh, so far. But you see that since uh, 2013, with the Bruce trial, and then uh, later on with a lot of other trials, now the paradigm is uh, shifting. And now the idea is to remove aspirin from the antithrombotic uh, uh, cocktail for a number of uh, good reasons, essentially. So we'll uh, uh, discuss this briefly. One of the uh, first reason, of course, it's obvious, is the bleeding risk, because uh, aspirin may increase the risk of intracranial and extracranial bleeding, especially in combination with other antithrombotic uh, uh, drugs. So, of course, no surprise that by removing aspirin from the antithrombotic cocktail, you reduce the risk of these two very important uh, and life-threatening complications sometimes. The second uh, uh, good reason is that uh, um, dual antiplatelet therapy has been established in an area in which, uh, of course, the combination was with the clopidogrel. Now, uh, since a decade, we have uh, uh, prasugrel, we have ticagrelor. So it could be that using monotherapy with this potent antithrombotic ag agent is enough to achieve a good platelet inhibition without increasing the risk of bleeding. The other uh, reason I think it's interesting because of course uh, uh, the evidence uh, for aspirin has been generated in, at a time when uh, the residual risk uh, of events was uh, pretty high. So of course you needed something on the antithrombotic side of the story in order to reduce this uh, uh, risk. But uh, this evidence has been generated when uh, statins were not uh, really the default the therapy in all uh, patients with coronary artery disease as inhibitors as well. So uh, perhaps by redoing all the aspirin trials uh, nowadays, the results would have been uh, a little bit less favorable for aspirin than uh, uh, we uh, typically assume. So now I would like to summarize uh, a little bit the clinical evidence uh, uh, for uh, the aspirin-free strategies in uh, patients uh, undergoing PCI 
with and without acute coronary uh, syndrome. So we'll show you where we are with randomized clinical uh, trials. So historically, now the first trial uh, has been a global leader, of course, uh, a mega trial, 16,000 patients. And uh, I will show you uh, only the primary endpoints for these trials because this is what matters uh, at the end. And the global leaders was a comparison of uh, a ticagular monotherapy after a short period three months of BAPT, uh, followed uh, by, uh, of course, uh, monotherapy again with Ticagular after 12 months. And the control group was uh, BAPT for 12 months, followed by aspirin monotherapy. And you see that uh, this strategy didn't prove to be successful uh, because the p-value was 0.073 in terms of all cause mortality or new Q-wave MI at two years. So it was almost there. There was a postdoc analysis of global leaders, which was a, a trial without adjudicated endpoint, particularly for bleeding. But in the glassy sub-study, out of uh, almost 8,000 uh, patients that they're going uh, PCI in the trial, uh, outcomes were fully adjudicated. So the, the primary endpoint was changes to all cause uh, mortality, myocardial infarction, stroke, or target first revascularization at two years, uh, and the results uh, didn't change too much. You see a higher rate of events because there is less uh, underreporting and there is also uh, an expansion in the uh, primary endpoint. But essentially, the uh, investigators led by Marco Algimi were able to show non inferiority for the Ticagal monotherapy approach, but they didn't show a superiority. But this was just the beginning, I must say, because then uh, it came a uh, twilight by Roxana Ameran and the twilight investigators. Here, uh, a high-quality trial because it was double-blinded and the outcomes were adjudicated. And uh, it was designed uh, with an efficacy endpoint, which was uh, bleeding. It was not uh, uh, any ischemic uh, endpoints. Uh, and uh, perhaps this is the most meaningful uh, um, endpoint when you design a trial that is shown to uh, look at the effect of removing aspirin from the antithrombotic cocktail. So uh, 7,119 uh, patients uh, at three months from PCI, even free, and uh, the comparison was between uh, Ticagulo plus placebo versus Ticagulo plus aspirin. So the primary endpoint was bar 2, 3, or 5 bleeding at 12 uh, months, meaning 15 months from PCI, 4.0% in the Ticagulo monotherapy group, 7.1% in the DAPT uh, group. Uh, that corresponded to another ratio of 0.56 uh, that was uh, highly statistically significant. Uh, very interestingly, the uh, trial also looked uh, in terms of non-inferiority at uh, an ischemic or thrombotic endpoint, which was all cause that MI or stroke. And uh, here uh, we saw uh, exactly the same uh, proportions of events, 3.9%, and that uh, achieved the uh, endpoint and the objective of uh, non inferiority. So essentially, the authors uh, concluded that ticagal monotherapy was associated with a lower incidence of clinically relevant uh, bleeding. Uh, then uh, I think it's very relevant also to mention uh, TICO because this is the third trial essentially that was uh, done with Ticagal monotherapy in a different population because this was uh, uh, exclusively performed in patients uh, with acute coronary uh, syndrome, so which uh, makes it very interesting. So again, it was an experimental strategy, which I would say is very similar to the twilight strategy. Uh, the primary endpoint, however, was the net adverse cardiac event, an endpoint mixing thrombotic ischemic and bleeding events at 12 months. You see 3.9% with the Ticagal monotherapy, 5.9% with the control uh, group, and that was uh, significant with a reduction of 34% in relative terms. Uh, looking at the uh, bleeding endpoints, you see what is the advantage, of course, of uh, uh, the monotherapy, uh, reducing major bleeding 1.7% versus 3.0%, V-value 0.02. And of course, I want to acknowledge also that there are two important trials uh, from Asia on clopidogrel. Uh, monotherapy, one from Japan, one from uh, uh, South Korea, and both uh, uh, showed that clopidogrel monotherapy is an option in uh, uh, patients undergoing relatively uh, simple PCI uh, imaging guided. That's very important to acknowledge. So a well-performed PCI, and uh, if you have uh, this kind of uh, procedure, then you can aim for a shorter uh, DAPT using clopidogrel monotherapy. So in stop DAPT, uh, clopidogrel was used for one month, and in smart choice, clopidogrel was used for three months. Very favorable results, and both trials uh, uh, met the uh, objective of non-inferiority. For NACE at 12 months, it stopped up two, and NACE at 12 months for smart uh, choice. So let's put all together now, because of course we have a meta-analysis that uh, uh, put together these uh, uh, trials that in a way are different, but also similar in terms of their uh, key objectives. Uh, so putting together global leaders, a smart choice, top that two, Twilight and Tico, what you 
consolidate in the meta-analysis is a reduction in bleeding, obviously 40% relative risk reduction, and you do not have to uh, pay a price in uh, MACE. And actually, uh, MACE is trending in the right direction, which is uh, a reduction in thrombotic uh, events as well, 12%, although not statistically significant. So the evidence supporting the aspirin free strategy is becoming uh, a little bit more robust now after uh, five trials. Uh, what we have uh, learned uh, in parallel is also why this uh, strategy works. And of course, we still uh, have uh, something to learn, but also uh, we have uh, observed many uh, pharmacodynamic studies that uh, explain uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, more in detail the story. So one that was published before the Twilight uh, study is from uh, Paul Armstrong, a pivotal uh, pharmacodynamic study that shows that the strong P2I12 receptor blockade alone causes inhibition of platelet aggregation that is little enhanced by aspirin. That was an in vitro study. But then uh, uh, we have seen also a sub-study from Twilight, Yusman Barber and Roxana Meran again, uh, that shows that the antithrombotic potency of ticagrelin monotherapy is similar to that of ticagrelin aspirin with respect to uh, in vivo blood thrombogenicity and what you can see with the body bone chamber. So essentially this explains why the results of uh, Twilight were so favorable in terms of uh, uh, equity in ischemic endpoints. Uh, another study that was uh, published on platelets uh, uh, recently comes from the global leader investigators. They demonstrated cessation of either component of DAPT leads to substantial increase in platelet reactivity with differential effects on different pathways. So essentially they suggest that of course, if you abandon one of the two pathways, you have something to, uh, uh, to lose. Uh, obviously there is uh, an increase in platelet reactivity, but maybe this is uh, enough. And finally, this study, which is called template, it's a trial, shows very elegantly that in complete inhibition of the glycoprotein six receptor mediated platelet activation, may contribute to the lower bleeding rate observed with tecaril compared with DAPT. So when you abandon aspirin, essentially you have uh, an incomplete inhibition of, of this receptor particularly, and this may explain why you have uh, less uh, bleeding. Very interesting, and of course, again, an evolving uh, story. So I would like just to uh, conclude with uh, something about uh, the state of the art for guidelines and also a look to the uh, future. So this is uh, our guideline in uh, Europe uh, for uh, patients with acute coronary syndrome without a T segment elevation published in 2020. So the aspirin free strategy now has uh, its own class of recommendation, which is 2A. And uh, this means that uh, this strategy should be considered depending on the balance between ischemic and bleeding uh, risk. If you look at the, the same recommendation in the overall flow chart, essentially for now, uh, this is uh, quite surprisingly intended for patients at low bleeding risk, but also low ischemic risk. While well, we know that in twilight, both type of patients uh, were actually not really the main part. There were uh, patients at high uh, risk of thrombosis uh, or bleeding. So of course, uh, that would be interesting to, uh, to discuss maybe. And finally, uh, look at the future. There are many trials ongoing, many from uh, Asia and many from South Korea. And you see that essentially these are a comparison at different time points of clopidogrel monotherapy, prasuvel monotherapy, take our monotherapy. So this strategy is here to stay, or at least it will be investigated more in detail also in the uh, near uh, future. So I would like to conclude by saying that aspirin has been for years the background therapy of several investigations and new antithrombotic drugs or strategies, but this paradigm is uh, slightly and uh, slowly uh, changing. There is little apparent pharmacodynamic benefit in adding aspirin to prasugal or uh, ticagro. And finally, among selected patients with and without SES undergoing PCI, and who have completed a short-term DAPT with a P2I12 inhibitor plus aspirin, the state of the art now tells that uh, dropping aspirin may significantly lower the risk of clinically important bleeding without increasing the risk for ischemic events. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Davide. That uh, uh, really did a tremendous job summarizing an increasingly complex uh, and uh, data-rich uh, uh, area. Uh, so the last uh, speaker in the session before we get to the uh, discussion is uh, um, one of our hosts, uh, D.W. Park uh, from Asan Medical Center, will be speaking on uh, both escalation and de-escalation strategies for chip PCI uh, temporal tuning in the tailored, tailored chip trial. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the uh, escalation and the de-escalation strategy for chip PCI patients. This is some temporary tuning in our ongoing trial, the tailored chip trial. This is my disclosure. So, and looking at the depth uh, practice guideline is relatively simple. It's based on 
ACS versus stable and HVR yes or no in the on the basis of the two key factor decide the duration of the adapted duration. But real world practice is not simple. There are many factors considered and increased ischemic risk, increased risk of stent thrombosis, increased breathing risk, and increased high risk of patient. There are many factors should be considered to balance that ischemic and breathing risk. And ischemic Bleeding balancing is much complex in real world setting and theory and the random trial is very simple, but reality there is a clustering effect, mortality, ischemic event, and bleeding event. And the theory and the one recipe in random trial is simple okay, but reality diverse and different recipe in the real world setting and individualized treatment decision is required and we require the, uh, much more recipe for individualized anti therapy. And the uh, last 10 years, there are multiple random trials for tailored antithrombotic strategy in high-risk ischemic or bleeding PCI patient. It's aspirin omission and ticagalidin monotherapy trial-like globally. The TICO trial, short depth and clopidogrel monotherapy and the smart choice stop. Step two and dose reduction is host to reduce polytech ACS trial and PCI and AFib trial and PCI and the stable coronary artery disease and diabetic. There is some sort of a concept escalation and compass Tamis and Alpheus trial. So I'm gonna a uh, little bit uh, the concentrate about the uh, uh, recent trial with Ticagalera for high risk PCI or patient twilight trial Tamis PCI trial. Alpheus trial, our tailored chip trial, four trial using ticagalera. So twilight trial is a well-known landmark trial and the uh, design is everybody nowhere and the PCI in the uh, drug eluding stand and patient should have clinical criteria plus angiographic criteria is there was a uh, uh, the defined high risk uh, p uh, patient. And the twilight trial at three months, so one arm is continuation, ticagalera plus aspirin. Uh, the experimental arm is uh, uh, ticagalera plus placebo, just the ticagalera monotherapy. And the primary endpoint, the bleeding BAC 235 in the much higher ticagalera plus aspirin. And the secondary endpoint, the death semi stroke, there was no difference at all between two groups. Tamis PCI trial is evaluated the ticagalera added to aspirin in diabetic and stable coronary artery disease. This is a key subgroup analysis according to prior PCI. And the Tamis PCI included each arm more than 5,000 patients ticagalera versus placebo add one aspirin. Looking at the primary efficacy out outcome, cardiovascular death, MI stroke inpatient history of the PCI, ticagalera potent therapy, much better, and the, there is no difference, no history of PCI population. And the, looking at the net clinical benefit, this is a, a much better inpatient history of the PCI, and the inpatients no history of PCI, there was no difference, P interaction was statistically significant. An Alpheus trial recently published in Lancet Journal in the presented in AHA last year and inclusion criteria non-emergent elective PCI. Patient should have at least one high risk feature, patient related or procedure related, there is a high risk patient. And the primary outcome was a third universal definition per procedure MI. There is no difference ticagalera versus clopidogrel standard group. And the uh, different MI category, stent thrombosis and the major myocardial injury, there is no difference. Clinical outcome at 30 days, to one month, there is no difference, that's MI or stroke. And the safety is the breathing event back one or two, and any breathing from back one to five significantly higher in, uh, in treat, after treatment of ticagalera reference to clofidogrel. 
And recently, a couple of uh, days ago, very nice paper was published in review article in New England Journal of Medicine. Robert Harrington was uh, the key author and the management of antithrombotic therapy at ACA. This is a story about temporal antithrombotic tuning. And uh, that is a story about temporal antithrombotic tuning. And the uh, early stage is uh, ischemic risk much higher, late stage in the breathing risk much higher than thrombotic risk. According to temporal changing of ischemic and breathing risk, they suggest the early time aspirin plus the newer generation P2I12 inhibitor later time, they recommended just P2I12 inhibitor alone. That was a very nice concept. And the tailored chip trial is targeting complex chip trial. This is actively ongoing our trial. And the tailored chip trial trial hypothesis uh, is uh, nearly same in the New England Journal of Medicine review article. People six months after implantation of the stand targeting complex high risk patient ischemic risk much higher. At the time, we're going to use potent strategy for targeting all these chemical risk, low dose ticagrelor plus aspirin. After six months, we do de-escalation for targeting late breathing risk, just to use clopidogrel only. And the tailored the CHIP trial, we include 2,000 patients undergoing complex high-risk CHIP PCI randomization. One arm is conventional clopidogrel plus aspirin, uh, 12 months. Uh, the, Experimental arm is the tailored group, six months, early aspiration, low dose ticagrelor plus aspirin, lay part, clopidogrel alone. So, and the rationale for low dose 60 milligram ticagrelor is based on our, our optimal trial published in the uh, JAG and the 60 milligram ticagrelor nearly more uh, same the efficacy standards to take more potent in clopidogrel inclusion criteria. We include the contemporary new dr generation drug luring stand. Patient should have at least one uh, any feature of a chip and the region or procedure related factor like a left main bifurcation requiring two stand CTO severe calcified region TPG long region multi vessel PCI and the long stand implantation looking at clinical factor diabetics and CKD and severe elbow dysfunction key exclusion criteria was a uh, enzyme positive ACS and the need for co chronic oral anticoagulation primary study endpoint is a net clinical outcome defined death MI stroke stent thrombosis urgent revascularization and the clinically relevant bleeding PAC 2, 3, 5 at 12 months post PCI. And we already enrolled over 500 patients, 25%. And the end of the next year, we expect to confidently enroll patient. And the summary, optimal antithrombotic strategy in chip population because of a rapid changing guideline in response to multiple clinical trial of a new therapy, the management of antithrombotic agent for patient after ACS or PCI is becoming increasingly complex. In the real world setting, uh, there is no single and simple scenario for optimal antithrombotic strategy for complex chip patient. Balancing ischemic and breathing complication after complex chip PCI is important dilemma for treating clinician. Therapeutic strategy, decouple thrombotic risk from hemorrhagic risk would be required, uh, should be individualized for tailored, potentially dynamic, antithrombotic therapy in patient receiving chip PCI procedure. Our tailored chip trial, adapting early escalation and the late de-escalation strategy will provide valuable clinical evidence for management of a complex chip PCI patient. Thank you for your attention. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Park, uh, and all of the uh, 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 speakers for some uh, outstanding uh, talks. So there, this is a really complicated lecture. I'm, I, you know, it's an area. I'm actually very glad uh, that I don't have to give a lecture now. When I started giving lectures on this, it was much simpler, um, but now things have gotten uh, uh, substantially more uh, more complex. So I had a couple of questions that I wanted to try to ask uh, the panelists and the and and, and the speakers. Um, one of the topics that uh, came up, and 
uh, gets, I mean, it certainly gets a lot of play in it, but we don't see very much evidence on it, is the idea of complex procedures. So Philippe uh, 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 sort of uh, presented a little bit of data on this from their uh, uh, sort of uh, customized uh, uh, trade-off model and did show that uh, complex uh, uh, PCI was among the risk factors for uh, uh, thrombotic events, uh, but also for bleeding events uh, uh, and with similar, uh, similar relative risks. So my question really for the, uh, for the, the, the entire panel um, and I actually wanted to start with, with Bobby on this because I think Bobby does chip procedures uh, and has a very good grasp of all of this is, so how important is procedural complexity in making this decision? Is it, you know, should we be worried about it at all? Or is it really much more of a, uh, you know, the clinical factors and the bleeding risk factors are by far the dominant ones. How, you know, how much should we worry? I did a left main bifurcation. How much should we worry? I did a CTO um, in making these decisions. Yeah, and I, I think um, it's a really important question. I, I think we spoke a little bit about it before, and, and I and, and I think KW mentioned this also before, which is it looks as if the data supports the idea that that lesion anatomic complexity matters particularly early. So it matters. I think it definitely matters within the first three to six months, um, and that that's been shown by you know Gennaro Justino's uh, paper that looked at the same data set that was used to derive the precise DAP score. Now. When you look longer, it looks like it matters less and less over time. So we couldn't, you know, con we couldn't confirm that finding in the DAP study. Of course, we started at a year out and went longer than that. So by that time, you sort of had declared yourself if you had a complex PCI early and you had a recurrent event, et cetera. But it's also important to note that in none of these trials were, were the most complex procedures that I think that we're really routinely doing included. Now, the one uh, you know bit of evidence that I'm really like, look that I, I think is really important, and it, it was relevant to I think Philippe's study in the trade-off model, which I think is really important, is that in Onyx one, you know Onyx had a very complex lesion set of the short duration DAP trials. It probably had the most complex. It had median you know stent lengths in the 30s, um, and so the fact that there's low stent thrombosis in that study to me is very re reassuring. So in clinical practice, but I think Roxanne also alluded to this earlier, which is you know, we have to do PCI really well. And so this sort of implores us to do, you know, post-dilation high pressure imaging. And this is something that in Asia they do routinely in the in, in United States, we don't do this routinely as well. And I think that may be part of the reason why you see much better results of shorter duration depth in your studies than we do sometimes in ours. So I think all of those factors, but it matters early, it matters in the procedure, it seems to matter less late as we go on. That's that that's that's great. Uh, and very helpful. It is, you know, it is a challenging area uh, uh, to, to make decisions. Let me um, ask a, another area that we really haven't covered that I think we should take advantage of the expertise here and ask Dr. Finn um, specifically uh, around the issue of uh, uh, stent types. I mean, you've done a tremendous amount of research on healing after uh, drug eluting stents. Uh, we have data now, you know, of differing types and quality uh, for at least, you know, three of the contemporary drug eluting stents uh, that are available. How much do you think the stent type matters uh, in making these decisions uh, in 2021? I think the stent type does uh, have, does matter to some extent. I mean, I think what we've shown and what others have shown is that polymer coated stents do better from a thrombotic standpoint than uh, metallic surfaces. I think Philippe showed that very nicely in his lecture where he showed metallic stent, a bare metal stent was actually a risk factor for thrombotic events. So, you know, it translates again and again, and some stents that we have on the market today, like for instance, a Synergy has a luminal surface of a metallic stent, doesn't have a polymer coating. Whereas the two stents that have been tried and succeeded in the 28 day DAP trials are Zions and Resolute. Both of them have polymeric coatings. Now they're different polymeric coatings, but I think those coatings make a big difference in terms of the ability to come off of uh, DAPT quickly. And I, I would add that David's, David's lecture was also very good because I tend to disagree in some extent with the basic science that some of he showed, which is that he seems to suggest that the combination of aspirin plus ticagrelor gives you no increased antithrombotic benefit versus ticagrelor alone. Now that may be true. I've studied it in the setting of aspirin plus clopidogrel. And there clearly I see a synergistic benefit with the two of them versus one alone. So I think there's a, so much uh, moving targets in terms of the types of therapy, the newer P2Y12, et cetera. 
The, uh, I mean, you know, uh, thanks. I mean, again, it is it is really complex. I think the point about the polymers is a very uh, interesting one, and you know, one that bears watching as you know more and more uh, 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 stent types uh, uh, come out. Uh, let me turn to this question of the type of the antiplatelet drug. So we've, you know, we've seen really two different drugs that have been studied um, as single antiplatelet uh, P2Y12 inhibitors. We've seen studies with uh, ticagrelor, which are really, um, the, I mean, many of the largest uh, uh, studies like Global Leaders and Twilight. Uh, and then we've seen studies with clopidogrel, which have largely been restricted to um, uh, uh, Asian patients um, who are, you know, we, uh, I think, uh, KW has done a lot of work telling us that Asian patients are different uh, with respect to a, a thrombotic risk uh, and uh, a, a lot of other things. So let me ask, actually, let me ask uh, KW first. So do you think, uh, you know, both for Asia and for uh, Western patients, the choice of the P2Y12 inhibitor matters with respect to shortening DAP, shortening DAP re removing aspirin. Does it matter to you uh, uh, in your practice? And what do you think it should matter in, in those of us who don't practice in Asia? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, um, the, the issue of which DAP is, is important um, um, when you weigh that against sort of what the risk is in your population that you're treating. So if the patient you're treating um, has a very, very high, um, you know, uh, bleeding risk, uh, are you okay um, putting that person on a very potent antiplatelet agent? And one thing with the aspirin-free strategy is um, it's good when you compare that against DAPT. So if you look at all of the trials that were, were positive, it was comparing against a DAPT strategy. Um, and also if you look at the population that was studied in these uh, trials, it's uh, sort of the more high bleeding risk population. So Twilight was the HBR population. Um, the rest of the trials were mostly done in Korea. The TICO trial was done in Korea. Um, the, smart, uh, the Smart Choice trial was done in Korea. Um, the StopDAP2 was done in Japan, which is an East Asian population. So sort of as, as an uh, ethnic group, it's a more slightly higher bleeding risk population than say a Western population in my opinion. Um, and so it was in a sort of a high, uh, a slightly higher bleeding risk population where the aspirin-free strategy um, was, um, you know, good compared against a DAPT strategy. I would actually like to ask the panelists and um, the lecturers what they think uh, would be the, the strategy when you've done the, you know, six months DAPT or when you're finished with the one year DAPT or 18 months of DAPT and when you're, um, going when, when previously it would have been a time to go to aspirin monotherapy, would you still put your patient on a P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy um, instead of um, the, the, the aspirin monotherapy where actually there's no evidence at all currently. Um, and if you look at the, 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 the only trial, the, the trial that Patrick did um, within one year to two years, actually, you know, that was the time where um, ticagrelor monotherapy was compared against aspirin monotherapy. And the global leaders trial, actually ticagrelor didn't do so well um, from one year to two years. So uh, my question would be, you know, what's the best strategy after that one year or, or six months or 18 months um, um, when, when previously would, we would have put the patient on a, a, a single aspirin? I don't know, Sunil, you want to take that on? You want to? Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, these, they're, these are really great questions. And I guess I can tell you in our practice, we tend to go back to aspirin. Um, you know, is that the right answer or not? I don't know. I think we need a lot more data in that particular uh, uh, clinical situation. So, um, yeah, I, you know, like I said, our practice, we tend to go back to aspirin. We drop the P2Y12 and uh, hopefully there will be some trial. But we do lifelong aspirin. The sure. Roxana, do you want to weigh in on that? And, and in particular, I, I still want to just come back to this question of, um, you know, can we, you know, can we in, in the West, can we go with clopidogrel alone, you know, in the first year um, without testing? Can we, you know, can we do that? And maybe, maybe ask Dominic that question as well after, after Roxana. So, so I, I actually think that, um, you know, this is a, a very evidence poor area for the prolonged, for the longer duration. I don't think you should look at the global leaders um, data and say that Ticagrelor did worse or didn't perform as well because 
I think we know that from one to two years, if you actually look in the appendix of global leaders, that many, many patients were no longer on ticagrelor or monotherapy. There was a very tough, um, uh, you know, adherence to the to the study drug was was very difficult to ascertain, and and we knew that many had gotten off. And when you randomize at the time of PCI to a drug that's BID, as well as there are some important side effects like shortness of breath, you're just not going to get the adherence to that drug as much as you want. And then beyond a year, it also becomes difficult. So I think this is a very important trial. To, to do, to understand after a year. To me, evidence suggests from Pegasus that a, um, especially in, in the um, clinically relevant, uh, you know, uh, high risk patients with ischemic burden that um, Ticagrelor did well, but there was a, a, a payback with bleeding. And so if you drop aspirin, maybe you can actually have a Pegasus effect that everyone was looking for and unfortunately missed uh, because there was no placebo, um, uh, you know, there was no no aspirin arm. Everybody was on, on both. And now we have both Prasagrel and Ticagrelor with really good, uh, especially with Ticagrelor, we have good evidence with the lower dosing to the 60 milligrams or the five milligrams of Prasagrel. And so to me, it just seems that we should be evaluating this. And probably in most cases, the patients would do well on clopidogrel monotherapy for a longer period of time. We just don't have the evidence around it. Um, as, um, as Sunil mentioned very well, the Capri trial comparing um, clopidogrel to aspirin, I would choose clopidogrel any day over aspirin if we just had the Capri trial to look at. And um, back then we didn't have all this other risk modifiers. So think about how much better we would do. So in my mind, I think we have um, a lot more to learn about the longer uh, late therapy in secondary prevention after PCI. So let me finish up with one last question for, for Dominic. Uh, again, just going back to uh, uh, the, this issue of of testing and whether clopidogrel is good enough. So, you know, what what is your thought here? You know, again, practicing in you know the deep south, the, the you know the MI and stroke belt of the United States. Um, you know, high ischemic risk patients uh, for sure uh, uh, there. So, you know, are you comfortable with single? You know, in the first year after PCI, single antiplatelet with clopidogrel only um, without testing. Are you comfortable there? Or do you feel like we, you know, if you're gonna to go to that strategy, you need to use something that's a more potent, either prasagrel or, or ticagrel, or if you're not gonna test? The short answer is no. I fully agree <laughs> with what Roxana <laughs> mentioned before. Um, I have a lot of reservations about going to a, a clopidogrel monotherapy, particularly in our neck of the woods. Um, without, without knowing how they respond. One of the things that we've implemented at our center, everybody coming to the cat lab uh, undergoes uh, rapid genetic testing. It's within the electronic medical record. It's an EPIC. And we integrate a scoring system, which is the ABCD gene, because you want clinical factors plus genetic. And, um, and, and, we actually, and we use it, but I, I do not feel comfortable with a clopidogrel monotherapy without knowing uh, that that patient uh, will not be uh, uh, responding. So as, as, so as long as they're, you know, they're not a, you know, I mean, and, and do you, you know, heterozygote, how, you know, how do you deal yeah, with those? The, yeah, so, yeah, so we look, we, look, we look at the gene, having the gene alone uh, or the, the, the STAR2 uh, does not necessarily mean you're a non-responder. So you can just have a STAR2 and uh, be a good responder. Uh, but if you have a STAR2 and uh, you have diabetes, you're obese and you uh, have chronic kidney disease, that automatically uh, sets you at a very high probability uh, of having high platelet activity while on uh, while on clopidogrel, so we we this is uh, what we've been doing. We've slowly educated uh, all of our interventional uh, uh, colleagues. They actually look for it in Epic, um, and um, so this is what we do. And we've implemented it also in our patients with AFib undergoing PCI, where we traditionally stop aspirin early, particularly on high-risk patients. Because again, I don't know an AFib 
patient who is not complex uh, mm -hmm. because we don't want to stop uh, aspirin levomonclopidogrel alone. The, uh, well, thank you very much. I think we're just you know, really out of time here. I could go on with, I have, I have a billion questions because this is such a complicated area. I think the group you know, as a whole has done a phenomenal job of trying to cover um, all, of these, uh, all of these different areas. Um, I look forward to uh, uh, moderating this session for the next 20 years, DW, I think to um, hopefully get these things uh, ironed out uh, uh, e even further. I can think of no better of a group of uh, uh, panelists to uh, spread both the clinical, uh, basic science, clinical science uh, uh, areas. And I really wanna thank on behalf of my co-moderator, Dr. Kimura, and all of the organizers, uh, the entire group uh, for a really wonderful session. Uh, wish you all a great meeting uh, and a, 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 a terrific uh, a day and hope to see everyone in person at some meeting sometime very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see everyone in person meeting in the next year at HT 2022.